So Amanda helpfully put some tissues right, right near me here, <laughs> just in case. I'm going to hope I don't need them, but you never know with me, do you? <laughs> you just look beautiful on this homecoming Sunday. You just look beautiful. Look at the choir and look at you. And all of you at home, I know you look beautiful too. Yes. Let us pray. Your church, your people, your world, your creation, it's all about you, God. Clear our minds, open our hearts, that we may hear and be transformed by your word. Amen. Nothing really ends. Every ending is a beginning. Ending is an illusion. In the very instant a thing ends, something is beginning. The thing just over is carried into what follows like a river flowing past a spot fixed by your gaze. Same spot, same river, fresh water. What have I learned 48 years into this ministry? To persevere is to start over and over and over and over. After every defeat, after every victory, after every disaster, after every recovery, after every loss, after every gain, after every insult, after every word of praise, after every sin, after every mercy, after every failure, after every triumph, to preserve is to endure. To persevere is to start over. To begin again, each breath a treasure, every moment a gift. Amen. End of sermon. I'll sit down now. <laughs> Except along the way, there is this. For me, gratitude, community, justice, and love. Gratitude. I was in my last year of seminary and found my way into a class on the pastor as person. Something like that. That might have been it exactly. It was taught by a fresh out of a PhD program at Yale in ethics professor. His name is Robert Stewart. He's retired now, living in the Denver area, I think. He wrote in the margins of my final paper these words, among lots of red marks <laughs> all over it, punctuation. He wrote this, Mike, you are like a beautifully crafted harp, and when the spirit of appreciation flows through you, you make good music. When your writing finishes maturing, a lot of people are going to groove to listening to it. <laughs> that explains all the red marks, right? <laughs> I've tried never to forget that. I've tried to live with gratitude for sky, earth, sea, for living things of all kinds who have as much claim to the planet as we do, for distant places and home, for family, for every experience and encounter, for what each has to show, teach, give, take, discipline, shower with grace, awaken to new realities. 
I've tried to express gratitude in the moment to let people know when they've done or said, when who they've been has made a difference in me, for me, for others. I marvel at the gifts of others, and we all have them. So I pray you live with gratitude, Riverside, for your history this homecoming Sunday, for the deep blessings of your inheritance, this building, your distinguished pastoral legacy, the rich history of progressive engagement with the issues of the day, and your contributions to justice, and not least, gratitude for the lives you've led together, the children raised and sent into the world to do good, the spirit of this place, open, affirming, inclusive. So gratitude, gratitude, and community. I was fortunate, perhaps in that same class, to be introduced to the work of Henry Nouwen, in the classic little book, I've mentioned it before, Making All Things New, An Invitation to the Spiritual Life. His simple and profound teaching about the disciplines of solitude and community, from which have flowed the lifelong practice for me of shutting up knowing when to be quiet, learning to be still, to pause, to listen, to be open to others, open to the whisper of the Spirit out of the deep silence, solitude, and stillness of the present moment, of the presence. Our world is noise clattering, clanging noise of commerce, selling, hawking, marketing, clanging materialism. It's everywhere, all the time, and we are drowning in the noise. And I hope your apartment, your home, your neighborhood park, some favorite piece of the shoreline around the city is your place of solitude, your retreat from the ever-present din of life these days. Some of you may know, maybe even experienced, I dislike being interrupted. And more than that, I abhor interrupting others. So I try not to and fail often and cringe when others are interrupted by the impatience of listeners who know too much and cannot wait for another to speak, and cannot stand the silence required for a thought to settle, to land softly on a receptive ear, an open mind. Too many of us think my ideas and thoughts are the ones most worth hearing, and we rush to speak, tripping over and knocking aside the words of another, our minds and ears closed to whatever truth might be spoken. There's so much to learn from others as I have from you. That's why the discipline of community is so vital. We're in this together. No one stands alone, finally. We live, grow, learn, overcome, endure, transform, suffer and die in community, or our lives are bereft of the center that holds us together in the providence of God. The beauty, power, creativity of our individual lives is held together in the discipline of community. And don't hear that word as punitive, as the weight of the community suppressing an individual. The root of discipline is the Latin word for teach, learn, 
Exercising discipline in community is a loving act of nurture, formation, obedience, so that speaking the truth in love, we grow into a community of peace and justice through love at one with the God who created us. So gratitude and community out of which grows justice. Seminary is where I came to know Edler Hawkins. It would be difficult for me to express how profoundly he touched me and changed my life. He was kind, humble, wise, a pastor's pastor and a statesperson of the church and world. He was the first black moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. 33 years founding pastor of the only church he served, St. Augustine in the Bronx. He was a member of the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches. He was an eloquent prophet of the gospel. And better to hear him speak than for me to try to say more about him. Listen to this. It's a kind of curious and awful thing to watch a society collapsing before one's eyes. And that's precisely what we have been watching these past few years. And we can't blame it all on the corrupt and devious actions of a particular leader. It's not as simple a collapse as that. What we must remember is that it was a solid body of American citizens who affirmed that leadership as the way to go. And even up to the very last moments of that fallen leadership, a large group of folks couldn't believe they had chosen unwisely. Not just the wrong people, but even more important, the wrong set of values. You'd think he wrote that yesterday. <laughs> you know when it's from, 1974, Nixon. But he could be speaking to us now. Trump and his millions, I don't know if I wrote millions or meant minions or minions and writ, I meant millions, but they both fit, don't they? Trump and his minions who loudly chose the wrong person and the wrong set of values who insist on advancing the privilege of a few at the expense of many, and especially those in our nation and world who languish in the pit of a planet that was once a garden of Eden. The mythical garden of the Bible or the Eden this planet was before we put our grubby hands on it, started draining it of oil and polluting the skies and the waters all around us. It was Edler who taught me about beloved community and the blessed fact that congregational life, this life, is the basis, the bedrock of beloved community in the life of the church and the world. And even though more than half of my ministry has been in institutions and organizations, seminary and councils of the church, interfaith, anti-poverty work, and worker justice work, it has never been divorced from the vitality of congregations and their critical importance in embodying the values that sustain life, that counter injustice and oppression, that promote truth, that seek peace and reconciliation in a fractured world. And that's why I wanted to end my ministry in a congregation. And oh my God, it turned out to be you. 
<laughs> Gratitude, community, justice, love. And it was Edler who introduced me to this text. You heard Alexa read it. For a wide door is open to me, to us. And there are many adversaries. Keep alert. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Many adversaries. May I quote again from one of my favorite authors, Wendell Berry? We are increasingly making this a nation of peace, security, and freedom for the rich. We are at present completing the economic destruction of our rural and agricultural communities. We are destroying our farmlands, our forests, our water sources. We are polluting the air, the water, the land. Our professions have become greedy, unscrupulous, and unaffordable. Our factory products are shoddy and overpriced. Life is extremely difficult for the unwealthy and unpowerful children, old people, women, country people, the poor, the unemployed, the homeless. Violence is everywhere. An undeclared civil war is being fought every day in our streets, our homes, our workplaces, our classrooms. There is no retiring from this struggle. That's what I say I'm doing, retiring. There is no retiring from this struggle. I read or maybe heard Jesse Jackson 50 years ago say in a speech, retirement is inconsistent with everlasting life. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if some advanced civilization from some distant planet discovered Earth, us, it may be happening all around us, and abolished, I said an advanced civilization, and abolished the Second Amendment. <clears throat> oh, oh, I got a whole list. Hold on. The, the Second Amendment, the Electoral College. What if they apportion congressional representatives by state population? Elected the president by majority vote of the people. What if they made us ban plastic and clean up the ocean? assured a living wage for all, taught the true history of the United States, tax the rich. What if they forced the removal of Clarence, Amy, Samuel, Neil, Brett from the Supreme Court? Now, here's my last and final one. Y'all going to get up on this one. I just know it. Everybody's going to be up, oh, or, or as Alexa would say, everybody. Did I get that right? Everybody. Everybody. I'm, uh, Alexa, I'm talking to you. Everybody. Is that right? Everybody. Everybody's going to get up on this one. What if they put Donald Trump on trial without a jury of his peers? See? And you can, you can stay seated now. It's the, it's the second half of that. 
and in jail without the possibility of parole. <laughs> Look, I'm done after this. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> what, what are you gonna do, fire me? <laughs> My last day is September 30th. You make me go now, you have to clean out my office. <laughs> I'm just having fun, none of that's on the paper. Whatever. No one is going to save us from what we are doing to ourselves. What corporations, what governments, what the powerful and the obscenely wealthy are doing to our planet and to us all over the world, beginning right here in the United States of America. Surely the earth can be saved by all the people who insist on love. You know who wrote that? It's from an Alice Walker poem. Surely the earth can be saved by all the people who insist on love. Love. love is the only way out of this mess, through this quagmire, the only way to destroy the insidious systems that bind us and undermine our democracy, that deny the inherent reality of our kinship in the human family and our belonging together in the ecosystem of all life on earth. Organized love. Values-driven love, fearless, unconditional love, life-centered, earth-centered love, gendered and non-binary love, love that sees and loves color and hates the blind apartheid of a hierarchy of color. Love that is patient, kind, not envious, boastful, or arrogant, or rude. Love that does not insist on its own way, is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. Love that bears and believes and hopes all things love that never ends passed from person to person through generations until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. There is no retiring from this love. Life is grace. Love is the thing. Now that might have sounded like the end, but there's a tiny bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you for your graciousness to me, your warm embrace of me and Nancy. Here's the hard part. <laughs> I can do this though your warm embrace of me and Nancy, the deep spirituality of this community of pandemic prayer and fasting. I thank you for welcoming us into this beloved justice-seeking community, and I'll see you along the way to the future only love can create. Now, there's an amen there, but there's still a tiny bit more. <laughs> and I want to go back to the very beginning. Nothing really ends. Every ending is a beginning. Ending is an illusion. As soon as something ends, something new is beginning. What have I learned 
48 years into this ministry, to persevere is to start over and over and over every moment, every day. After every defeat, after every victory, this is what I've tried to do, after every disaster, after every recovery, after every word of praise, after every sin, I've sinned a few times, count it on one hand. <laughs> Unless Nancy's doing the counting. <laughs> after every mercy, after every failure, after every triumph, to persevere is to endure, to start over, to begin again. Each breath a treasure, every moment a gift.